Lord's Day 1, and the end says, because I belong to him, Christ by his Holy Spirit assures me of eternal life and makes me wholeheartedly willing and ready from now on to live for him. And I want to start this morning by asking you, when you look at the moon, what do you see? When you look at the moon, what do you see? Well, if you grew up in a uh, culture, let's say, of South and Central Brazil, so there's the moon, and, and, and as someone from South or Central Brazil who grew up with a heavy cultural Catholic influence in their life, when they look at that, what they see is St. George killing the dragon. Did you see it? How many of you saw St. George killing the dragon when you looked at the moon? But that's what they see. If you grew up, let's say, in Taiwan, then in line with Chinese mythology and Taoism, you would see the rabbit in the moon. No longer is St. George killing the dragon, but there's a rabbit in the moon. If you grew up in Brazil, where oppression and hardship is a way of life, then what do they see? Anyone know what that is? Donkey. A donkey. An animal that works hard for everything it has. And in North America, we've grown up, and when we look at the moon, what do we see? What do we see? Say it loud. The man in the moon. Do you see kind of the shape of the eyes and the nose and, and the mouth is blowing? And that kind of fits because our Western culture makes us the center of it. We, man, the independent, uh, capable man, is the center of our culture and our reality. And so when we look at the moon, that is what we see. Now... If we go with that, we, we can understand that out of our culture, our North American culture in the 21st century, we, we've gone through scientific reasoning and we've gone through post-modernity and we're enlightened. And so there's, there's kind of a way that, you know, through our life, uh, and we think about Colson, you know, here he was born into this lovely middle-class family uh, in Bowmanville in the 21st century where technology is booming and, and, and we're fairly affluent. He'll, he'll have his needs met. And all these things are going to shape his worldview. And we kind of have this, we can understand ourselves through these concentric circles, this image of our worldview. So the first part of that one is, is it there? Is there a, yeah, there it is, good. All right, so our culture. Around us is our culture, the values of our culture, everything we see and experience. And within, let's use Colson as an example, within Colson's culture, he's also being raised within kind of a subculture, isn't he? A subculture that says, I'm part of a Christian church. And so my view on life is going to be somewhat different than just a general culture around me. And that's going to affect my behavior, my values, and my worldview. Well, I share this with you, why? Because when we get to Lord's Day 1, and it says, because I belong to him, Christ by his Holy Spirit. His Holy Spirit is something that generally in our churches, we are just coming to understand. And I think there's an openness to it. So if we follow along and we say, you know, I never looked at the moon and saw a donkey, or I never look at the moon and even see a man. What I see when I look at the moon is just the moon. We can have that in our spiritual life as well. When I look at Christianity, what I see is the church. What I see is, is loving God. What I see is, is doing well and, and being kind and being faithful. But if our worldview and our, and our understanding of Christianity has been shaped in such a way that we've said, you know what, I don't really pay too much attention to the Holy Spirit. 
you know, if you ask me, has the Holy Spirit ever prompted me or guided me or spoke to me? I would have to say probably not. If you ask me, have I ever felt an overwhelming experience of the presence of God? Uh, a few times, yes. Would I, call, would I say that's the Holy Spirit? I don't know. I don't know. And so this morning, where we need to start is to say, are you open to understanding and possibly expanding your worldview, even your worldview of Christianity, to say the Holy Spirit is something that is significant in my understanding of Scripture and of Christianity. And the Holy Spirit is part of Lord's Day One, then I want to understand it. And so where I want to start, I'm going to give you five Steps this morning, five understandings. First of all, the Holy Spirit fills us with life. The Holy Spirit fills us with gifts. The Holy Spirit fills us with prayer. The Holy Spirit fills us with truth. And the Holy Spirit stirs us to action. So we're going to move somewhat, we'll see if it's quickly. I don't know. We'll see. We got time, right? Are you all comfortable? Everybody's got their peppermints? You already had them? All right. Last week, Kristen, you had a peppermint for me. Do you have another one after this one? Yeah? Good. All right. Fills us with life. The scripture I wrote in Colson's Bible was this one. I will sprinkle clean water on you, and you will be clean. I will cleanse you from all impurities and from your idols. I will give you a new heart and put a new spirit in you. I will remove from you your heart of stone and give you a heart of flesh. And I will put my spirit in you and move you to follow my decrees and careful to keep my laws. I had opportunity to see a preview of a movie that's being released on April 7th. And the movie is called The Case for Christ. And the movie is based upon a book that was called The Case for Christ. And the book was based upon the life of Lee and Leslie Strobel. And and 25, 30 years ago, Lee was adamantly against Christianity. And he worked as a reporter in the Chicago Tribune, for the Chicago Tribune. And he was a successful reporter. But he was very against Christianity. And through certain events at the birth of their child, Leslie began going to a church. And she experienced this transformation in her heart where she realized that there was a God who created her and loved her. And it changed her life. And so throughout this movie, it journals and shows the struggle that Lee has in coming to accept the reality of the resurrection of Jesus Christ. You see, because he wants to be against it. He wants to think that it's all foolishness. And so as as he looks and digs in and tries to understand what the truth about Christianity is, he begins to realize that maybe it isn't as crazy as he thought it was. And so God brings him on this transformational journey. And And the movie is really well done. But there's another piece that comes through. And that is as Lee is on this journey, his wife Leslie prayed this scripture. She prayed it again and again. To God, take from him his hard, obstinate heart. Transform it. Give him a heart of flesh, a heart of life, a new heart. And so throughout this movie, we see this breakdown in his worldview happen. And he comes to a point of realizing that Christianity not only makes sense, but he experiences the transforming power of the Holy Spirit within his own heart and his life. And, and in, in, in understanding, looking at that afterwards, you know, as he, he's debriefing about everything that's happened. He said, you know, one of the things that just had such an impact on me was your life. You are so different. You are so caring. You are so loving. 
You are so patient. And I pray that that is the mark of all of us who understand and accept Jesus Christ as Lord and Savior, that as we walk through life, others will notice that there is a difference because our heart of stone has been transformed to heart of flesh. I also want to just, while we're on it, let you know that this movie will be released uh, at the beginning of April. If you have friends who have questions or are struggling, this, the, the, the intention of this movie is so that many will know and understand who Jesus Christ is and how much he loves them. And so you have an opportunity now to start thinking and praying about who should I invite to that movie? Who could I go with and just say, you know what, I want to take you to a movie. It's a movie of Christianity, but my pastor says it's really good. He's seen it. They, you know, they actually talked about um, when they released the movie and they made the movie, their goal was that it wouldn't be a cheesy movie. That it wouldn't be a cheesy movie. When I first heard that, I thought, wow, that's not setting the bar too high, is it? But it wasn't. And it presented the truth of Christianity in a wonderful way. And I pray that it will be used as a tool for many people to understand God's love. So, on the following questions, the other four, I'm going to be asking you, where are you at? One, not so filled with the Holy Spirit. Two, five, I am filled with the Holy Spirit. But for this one, this is more like a computer switch. Zero. Actually, I got those are wrong. I did that wrong. Because one is on, right? In binary and computer language. So, one, flip those around. One, you, one, I have a new heart. Zero, I have a heart of stone. Ask yourself honestly, just in this moment, where are you really at? And if you're not so sure, maybe some of the following questions will help you understand. But one of the things that I pray is never said about anyone, that they go through life and they haven't accepted Jesus Christ as their Lord and Savior and they can come back and say, well, no one ever told me. No one ever explained it to me. So, where are you at? Are you filled with a heart, a new heart? Or would you say you might have a heart of stone? Second, he fills us with spiritual gifts. Now, talking with someone this past week about the reality that happens when, you know, we grow up, and this person is, is a, uh, a tender of AA. And so he's sharing his story. He's like, you know, the alcohol, like, if I drink that, I'm done. If it touches my lips, I'm done. And you see, the world wants to say, well, freedom and alcohol and partying and all these things bring you life. Doing whatever you want in our culture and in our culture's worldview is what life is about. Deny yourself nothing and don't worry about the consequences. That's the gospel that is preached. And when we look at the truth of Scripture, right? When we look at this book, we, we discern something very different. It says this, Galatians. So I say, walk by the Spirit and you will not gratify the desires of the flesh. For the flesh desires what is contrary to the spirit. You see, culture and the gospel. The flesh and the spirit what the contrary to the flesh. They are in conflict with each other. So that you are not to do whatever you want, but if you are led by the spirit, you are not under the law. Then it goes off and describes it. The acts of the flesh are obvious. Sexual immorality, impurity and debauchery, idolatry and witchcraft, hatred, discord, jealousy, fits of rage, selfish ambition, dissensions and factions and envy and drunkenness and orgies and the like. Look through that list a minute. Any of those things active in your life? Did you have a fit of rage this week? How about drunkenness? How many of you were sexually put yourself into inappropriate situations? Impurity. How many of you thought of stealing, making shortcuts? I warn you as I did before that those who live like this will not inherit the kingdom of God. Then it describes this, but the fruit of the Spirit is love, joy, peace, patience, kindness, goodness, faithfulness, gentleness, and self-control. Against such things there is no law. Those belong, who belong to Christ Jesus have crucified the flesh with its passions and desires. Since we live by the Spirit, let us keep in step with the Spirit. 
Let us not become conceited, provoking and envying other. Conversation I had recently with another pastor. He talked about someone in their church who was so aggressive and unkind, cruel, who was walked around constantly with a chip on the shoulder. And the people of that church said, well, that's just so-and-so. And I look at that, and I say, you know what? Those who have been given a new heart, their lives are transformed. Remember, we looked at the culture and then our behaviors. If our cultural understanding is such that Christ has loved me and set me free, then our understanding and our behavior out of that should be filled and descriptive of what we've just read there. I've asked you before, you know, to pick one of those. Message of maybe a year ago, I said, pick one of those and work on it. Was there one that kind of resonated? You said, oh yeah, I'm not doing very good with that one. Or I want to grow in that place. See, what scripture is teaching us is that we can ask God and God will give us those things. And so when we ask God and say, God, make me more patient. God, make me more loving. Make me more gentle. Lord, make me more faithful. The Holy Spirit, the Holy Spirit, right as the catechism says, right? Because I belong to him, Christ, how? By his Holy Spirit. Holy Spirit makes me wholeheartedly willing and ready to live for him. So, how are you doing? One, I'm not so filled Five, I'm really filled. Maybe go home and look at those. Open up your Bible to Galatians 5 and say, okay, let's rate myself. You want to have a lot of fun over lunch? Why don't you give it to your spouse or your kids? Let them rate you. Let me know how it goes. (laughs) Amen. Three, fills us with prayer. I'm going to tell you right now, this is where I'm, I'm getting a one or a two, okay? A moment of honesty, prayer, I need to grow in my prayer life. And I've talked to you about it before, how I'm trying to build in the discipline of rolling out of bed and praying. This morning, I didn't roll out of bed because it was too warm in my bed, so I prayed in my bed, but I didn't do it every day this week. And to be honest, when I went through this, you know, it says, when you pray, do not be like the hypocrites, for they love to pray standing in the synagogues and on the street corners to be seen by others. Now, let's stop a minute there. What it's saying is that a hypocrite is someone who only prays when and where it's expected and visible. And if I'm honest with you, most of the time I pray is in front of meetings, one-on-one, in front of you on a Sunday morning. My prayer life outside of that, it needs to grow. But here's the good news. I can ask the Holy Spirit, say, Holy Spirit, help me grow in this. Help me to recapture that. Help me to bring before you the needs of others. Another scripture says, and when you go, you go, so it continues on, excuse me, and says, truly I tell you, they have received their reward in full. But when you pray, go into your room, close the door, and pray to your Father who is unseen. Then your Father who sees what is done in secret will reward you. So, the Holy Spirit fills us with a desire to pray. Pray not just when it's expected or where it's expected, at dinner table or wherever else but an ongoing hunger for prayer. How are you doing? One, not so filled. Five, I'm filled. Fourth, fills us with truth. These two brief scriptures, I think, put together show us uh, the reality of being filled with truth. But when he, the spirit of truth, comes, he will guide you into all truth. That's actually not in Romans 8. That's a... John 15. Then in John 17, it goes on and it says, sanctify them by the truth. Your word is truth. I was listening to a Francis Chan clip this week, and he was outside working in his yard. Francis Chan was a pastor of a very large church, uh, written a couple of books, very gifted speaker. And so, you know, Jehovah Witnesses came up on his lawn while he was working. 
I said, you know, can we talk to you for a minute? We'd like to talk to you. And they said, about this, this book. And they held a Bible. And he was like, yeah, man, I'd love to talk to you. And so these, you know, unsuspecting Jehovah's Witnesses, they, you know, he talked about, you know, asked them some different questions, and he started sharing with them, and he's, you know, bringing out the Bible, he's saying, yeah, you know, it's not, we're not saved by our works, we're saved by God's grace, and, and quoting off all these scriptures, and at one point, the lady stopped, and she said, you know what, that's your problem, and he said, what, what's my problem, and he says, you need a leader to help you understand this book. And Francis Chan said, no. No, you see, that's your problem. Anyone can open this book, and anyone can read it, and anyone can understand the truth of this book when they open it. And I'm so thankful that we're seeing a change in our church and among you. That many of you at times and places where you didn't open the Bible before are opening God's word. And I'm hearing week after week the stories of people who are saying, you know what, I'm reading scripture, just one chapter a day. But wow, it's really having an impact on me. And if you grew up thinking in your worldview that you needed someone like me to stand up here to help you understand this, you've got it wrong. You have all that you need in order to understand this word. So how are you doing? Are you hungering for the word of God? Are you digging deep into his word? Are you drinking from his living water? One, not so filled. Five, filled. Then, final one, Holy Spirit fills us with action. This week, am I being filled with the Holy Spirit? So I, I told you I was doing bad at prayer. I'm doing pretty good on being filled with, the, with truth, okay? So, you know, we're never doing, ever, we're, none of us are doing great at everything, amen? Amen. amen? amen. We all have places we can grow, amen? amen. All right. And you're all going to go home and find out and think of which one is yours, Right? Amen. All right. So, action. I was read, reading Numbers 11, and I'd never, I don't know, I mean, I've read through the Bible before, but this story hadn't stuck out to me, I guess. And so, let me just read it to you. In this story, Moses, uh, yeah, you know, he's, he's got the work of the temple, and all these things are happening, and he's being overwhelmed. And what had happened is the people had come, and they had complained. They complained. And so, God said, you know what, this burden that you carry... This mantle that you carry of leadership is too much just for you. So the Lord said to Moses, bring me 70 of Israel's elders who are known to you as leaders and officials among the people. Have them come to the tent of meeting that they may stand there with you. I will come down and speak with you there and I will take some of the power of the spirit that is on you and I put it on them. They will share the burden of the people with you so that you will not have to carry it alone. And then later it said, so Moses went out and told the people what the Lord had said. He brought together 70 of their elders and had them stand around the tent. Then the Lord came down in the cloud and spoke with him. And he took some of the power of the Spirit was on them and put it on the 70 elders. When the Spirit rested on them, they prophesied, but did not do so again. However, two men whose names were Eldad and Medad had remained in the camp. They were listed among the elders, but did not go out to the tent, yet... The Spirit also rested on them, and they prophesied in the camp. A young man ran and told Moses, Eldad and Medad are prophesying in the camp. Joshua, son of Nun, who had been Moses' aide since youth, spoke up and said, Moses, my Lord, stop them. But Moses replied, Are you jealous for my sake? I wish that all the Lord's people were prophets, that the Lord would put his Spirit on them. You see, in the Old Testament, Holy Spirit was only put on certain people at certain times. And so in this story, God says, look, I'm taking the responsibility of the leadership of my kingdom, and I'm sharing it with others by giving them the Holy Spirit. And when I read that, I thought, 
how beautiful that is. I love nothing more than seeing dedicated followers of Christ who understand God's love, who are filled with his spirit, who pray, who read his word, who step into action. Say, you know what? I'm going to show God's love in his kingdom. I'm going to step out. I'm going to lead. I'm going to get involved because the Holy Spirit has been given to us not simply for us to enjoy all of the good gifts and blessings that God gives us, but to go and to show that love and his grace to many others. I've said it and we'll be working on it. I pray if you're not already involved in leadership, will you please just contact us and say, I need to get involved somewhere. I don't know where, but you know what? The Holy Spirit has filled me and I need to share that. And we will help you find a place to serve and to grow your gifts. So, the Holy Spirit comes to us, one, fills us with life. Two, gives us gifts. Three, fills us with prayer, fills us with truth, and invites us to action. Let's pray. Give you just a moment. One of the reasons I believe that people have a hard time hearing the Holy Spirit, because we expect Him sometimes in profound ways, but oftentimes it's just in those small, still voices. That impression, that idea that comes to us while we're driving or while we're silent. And so I'm going to give to you a gift right now of just a minute of silence where you can go before God. You can say, okay, God, of all the things that I've heard this morning, where are you inviting me to grow? Where are you inviting me to be filled more with your Holy Spirit? Speak to us, Lord Jesus. Today, if you hear the Lord's voice speaking to you, do not harden your heart, but humble yourself. He will, through his amazing power and presence in your life, transform you. If you're in the beginning stage and say, you know what, I've been off track, or this is new to me, just invite the Lord. Say, Lord, I invite you to give me a new heart. I don't understand it all, but I know enough to know that I no longer desire to go down the path I have been living, but I ask for your forgiveness and that you would lead me into a new life. Jesus Christ, when he was asked about what someone must do to inherit eternal life, said to him, you must be born again. And that birth, that new birth, comes because it's a spiritual awakening where we understand that there is a God who created and loved us and that the brokenness in our relationship with him can't be fixed by anything we do, and it can't be damaged by anything we've done. It simply is a gift that we receive when we say yes to the Lord Jesus. And if you've heard his voice, and he's inviting you to confess an area of disobedience or brokenness, 
then I ask you, how much longer would you like to go carrying that weight? There is something this morning that has come to you where you need to acknowledge and confess before someone else. Then let today be the day when your journey towards healing and fullness of life begins. Don't wait. And if the Lord has nudged you and said, I want to spend more time with you, prayer and in my word or in service, pursue. Don't let it go. But pursue the Lord and his riches will be yours. In your name we pray. Amen. Worship team.